How's everybody tonight? You got to turn on your camera face now. All right. Well, we're glad you're joining us tonight. We are live from Willing Vessels Christian Center Tabernacle. And we are going to continue our study in the book of James, chapter 2. I pray you're joining us live uh, and uh, are going to be with us tonight. Uh, if you would, be so gracious to uh, give to the Lord. If you're not in attendance and you're watching live, uh, the ways to give will be on your screen. Uh, if you will look there and see that. And looks like we got folks under the weather and uh, whatever else is keeping people at home. So uh, irregardless, there's the ways to give right there. Uh, cash check online, willingvessels.org slash give and of course, text is the best way and easiest way uh, to give. Uh, you text your amount to 336-747-3336, and that would be the best way to give. So, amen. Well, once again, glad you're joining us live. I'm glad you're here tonight in the tabernacle. We're going to be in James chapter 2. We'll pick up our study there. If you're watching live, please uh, turn in your Bible to James 2, uh, and... Once again, we're so glad you're with us. We want to pray tonight. Uh, I don't know if uh, we'll pray for Debbie and David. They seem to not be feeling well. Uh, and let's remember uh, tonight Sister Ann Irvin, who is in the hospital. Ron's here, and, uh, but she's in recovery mode, and we're thanking and blessing God for that. And she may be watching. I don't know, but if so, we're praying for you tonight, special. Uh, so let's remember her tonight uh, as she recovers in the hospital. Uh, from sickness and tonight anybody here have a request if you do you have to yell it at me anybody all right well join me in prayer would you heavenly father tonight we just give ourselves in complete surrender to you uh, in that we know that when we pray you hear us because you created the ear and we know that you hear you created the eye so we know that you see. And the eyes of the Lord are in every place watching over the good and the evil in the world. And Lord, I just pray for every person tonight who's joining us, watching, who may be sick in their body, that you would minister healing to them. I wish I could lay my hands on them. But Lord, your anointing is able to touch anybody anywhere. You are omnipresent and you are altogether lovely. And tonight I pray that healing would come in their bodies, and in their life, in the name of Christ. And Lord, for those here tonight, I pray that you would open up your word, Lord Jesus. Lord, I am a willing vessel. We are vessels unto honor. And it has nothing to do with us, but we have treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency and the power may be of God and not of us. And all glory and all power belong to you tonight. And I pray you would sharpen us in your word, sharpen us to be part of the kingdom of God, to fulfill the purpose and the call that you've placed upon our lives. Help us to see your word tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, James chapter 2, we're going to dive right in. Last week we talked about temptation. We talked about testing. Uh, what's the difference uh, who tempts us? Is it the devil? Is it our flesh, the world? And we concluded that it's all three, right? But in serving God, you're going to go through times of test. Uh, and in order to have great faith, great faith must be greatly tested. Great faith must be greatly tested. And you exhibit and exercise your faith by your faithfulness to God. That's what faith is. Faith is trusting God. In God's faithfulness, even in times of trial and times of tribulation, trusting and believing in the faithfulness of God, that is faith. But I want to look tonight at James chapter 2 uh, and verse 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. In other words, how can you have faith in Jesus Christ? and show partiality toward anyone with respect of persons. Verse 2, For if there come unto you into your assembly a man with a gold ring in godly apparel, 
And there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou here, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? And he says, Hearken, listen, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? Now, of course, he's talking about showing partiality, playing favorites with certain people, whether it be rich or upper class. And, and the problem with that in ministry is if you, if you do that, you have to keep doing it. If you have to show partiality to create a desire within someone to be in God's house or to be part of the ministry that you're doing, you'll always have to do that. And that's what James is saying here. Notice what he says in verse 6, but you have despised the poor. And do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats. In other words, when you cater to a certain demographic, you're enslaved to that because you have to continue to do that. And they exercise a, cer a certain power and authority over you. And that's something we need to hear tonight. But then he's, he's relating all this to works and faith. Faith and works. In fact, the book of James Martin Luther wanted to rip the whole book out of the Bible. He wanted to get rid of it. Why? Because James seems to say that not only does faith save you, but faith and works save you. And that if you do not have works to go with faith, then you do not have salvation. But that's not what James was saying. We're going to dive into that tonight uh, and look at that. So look with me at verse... Uh, look at verse 7. We'll just read through it here. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? For if you fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, then you do well. But if you have respect to persons, then you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Now, he moves into a different context. Look at verse 10. Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of it all. Now, listen to me tonight. All right? For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, let me say this. When you commit an act of sin... In essence, you have broken the law of God in its entirety. However, each individual sin, act of sin, sin of the flesh, or sin of the spirit, carries different consequences. Now, even though you may commit murder and you may lie, those are two different sins that carry two different sets of consequences. Yet, either you kill or murder or lie or steal, they're all breaking the law of God. If I go out here and I speed up Main Street, I've broken the law of North Carolina. If I go out here and commit murder, I've broken the law of North Carolina. But one is going to carry a weightier matter of judgment and consequence than the other. So the idea, and a lot of people say this, well, sin is sin. doesn't matter what. You know, well, every sin carries a different consequence to it. And some are weightier than others. That's why I believe in Revelation 21, the Bible says that the adulterer will have their place, the fornicator, the liar. Because I believe there's different levels of punishment indicated there in the passage. It's important that we understand this. It's important that we receive this tonight. James chapter 2 is probably the most important chapter in your New Testament. It truly is, and you're going to see why here in just a moment. Verse 11, For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. In other words, he's saying showing partiality will bring about judgment in your own life. 
not only showing partiality to certain people, but in the context, showing partiality to certain types of sin. And without extending mercy, one will not receive mercy. Verse 14, what doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say that he has faith and has not works, can faith save him? Now, when I was growing up, pastors and preachers used to preach this all the time. And they preached it in such a way that if you were living a sinful lifestyle, then that faith could not save you. In other words, you were saved by faith and grace, by grace through faith, but you remain saved by your works. That was how it was preached. That's how it was taught. In other words, salvation is a gift, but in order to keep it, you have to earn it. And they based it on this passage. If a man say that he has faith and not works, can faith save him? But you have to look into, you have to look into the literal Greek translation of that, which renders it like this. Can such faith save them? Can this kind of faith save an individual? In other words, can this kind of faith that does not produce good works and produce fruit, can that save someone? And the answer is an emphatic no. Because true saving faith, listen to me tonight, will produce good works. It will produce the fruit of the Spirit. So in other words, James is saying the individual that says, hey, I've been saved a long time. I got saved years ago. But they live a devilish, sinful lifestyle. Or they live a lifestyle that's not consecrated to God or Christ. They don't attend church and their excuse is that there's hypocrites and I'm saved, I don't need a church to go to heaven and all this. If that is the what you're hearing, this is the person James is talking about. And if that's you, that's who James is talking about. That kind of faith will not save anybody. Because true saving faith will produce good works, for by grace. Now, this is why Martin Luther wanted to get rid of the book of James, because Martin Luther, the reformer, he got a hold of Romans chapter 1, verse 16, that says, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And verse 17 says, the just shall live by faith. That was the whole message of Martin Luther. Now, Martin Luther stood on that. Faith alone, not works, faith and he thought James was contradicting him, but James is not contradicting him. They actually complete one another. Because Paul said, for by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But the very next verse says, we are saved to his workmanship. In other words, we are saved to produce good works and to do the work of the kingdom and bear the fruit of the Spirit. Come on, amen. That's what he's saying, and that's what James is trying to relate to us, is that true saving faith will, in fact, produce good works and the fruit of the Spirit. And if that's not evident in your life, then you need to check your relationship with God in Christ. Because someone just declaring they have faith in Christ, declaring that they believe is not enough, there has to be fruit. There has to be works unto righteousness. That's why James is so important. So many people are deceived into thinking that they are saved, that they are born again, that they have faith and are going to spend eternity with God, but they are sadly deceived because they've never put faith in Christ that produced good works and fruit. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 33, a tree is known by the confession it made years ago. The tree is known by the salvation card that they filled out when they were a child. No, no, no. He said a tree is known by its fruit. The fruit that it bears. What is in your life? What is in your life? Verse 15, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food. And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, but you warmed and, or be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead. 
What is James saying here? Faith, saving faith, is an action word. Everybody say action. Faith is an action word. So in other words, if you are truly born again, there's going to be some action in your life. Come on, anybody hearing what I'm saying tonight? If you're truly born again, that, coming to the house of God will not be a problem. You will not have to be prodded. You will not have to be pushed. The Spirit of God will drive you to His presence. Reading the Scripture will not be a problem. Praying will not be a problem because you are producing that. The Spirit of God is producing that in your life. But it does take effort on your part. Come on, amen. It takes effort. It takes the willingness inside of you because you're in a war tonight. You're in a war against the flesh. I'm not talking about your waistline. I'm talking about the sin nature that wants to keep you at home and wants to keep you down and wants to keep you frustrated and wants to keep you depressed and wants to keep you wallowing in self-pity. That's what the flesh desires. And you're in a war against the flesh. And the only way to overcome the flesh is to what? Walk in the Spirit. Live in the Holy Spirit. Maintain the presence of God in your life. If you believe that, shout amen. Maintain the presence of God in your life. How do you do that, Brother Atkins? Well, you do it like this. You pray. You read God's Word. You be in God's house. You be around God's people. Come on, anybody hearing me tonight? You are producing fruit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. You are patient toward your brothers and sisters in Christ, in the family of God. You're patient toward your family. You're patient toward people of the world. You're expressing the love of God to this lost and dying world. That is the proof that's in the pudding, that you are born again. Faith is an action word. Faith without works, verse 17, is dead. It's not faith at all. True saving faith will produce works. <laughs> I like verse 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. In other words, James is saying, You have a conversation with me, and you say, I have faith. I believe in Jesus. I'm all right. I'm going to heaven. I may not attend church faithfully. I may not do this. I may not tithe. I may not... You know, be the best Christian. People make every excuse in the world to be half-hearted and half-consecrated. But James is saying, that's not faith at all. Boy, it would be so sad to think that you were born again, that you were a Christian, to stand before God and have him say, depart from me, for I never knew you. That will happen to many. That will happen to many sitting on church pews. That will happen to many watching a live broadcast who think that they're right with God only to be under strong delusion because saving faith. In fact, put your finger there. Go with me to Titus. Take a left in your Bible. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. We talk about grace and Grace is the theme of the 21st century in the church world uh, that thank God for grace. I have grace. I'm living under grace. Grace extends further than my sin. Even though I sin, I'm covered by grace. That is a lie. Listen to me tonight. Verse 11, Titus chapter 2. I know this is strong, but this is the truth of God's word tonight. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us what? Now look, this is what the grace, what is grace, number one? Well, some say it's unmerited favor, and it is that. But it's more than that. Grace is God granting you and giving you what you do not deserve. You don't deserve heaven. You don't deserve eternity. You don't deserve salvation. You were born because of the sin of Adam, born in a state of unrighteousness and depravity and sin. 
that the grace of God so graciously, by His grace, He, he grants you salvation, grants you repentance, grants you forgiveness of sin, grants you a new life. And here's what grace teaches. Grace does not teach that you can live like hell and still be born again and saved. No, sir. Grace teaches this. Look at verse 12. Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts that we should live soberly and righteously and godly in what? This present world. So the grace of God teaches, if you're truly saved by grace, you will have a desire to deny ungodliness. You will have an innate created being within you after the nature of Christ becoming a new creation that, that your spirit man will say, I want to deny ungodliness. I want to get worldly lust out of my life. Come on, amen. You will have that. But here's the problem so many times. People get so caught up with the world, with ungodliness, that it pulls them away from their relationship with God the Father in Jesus Christ. Come on, amen. And draws us away from the grace of God. And the enemy wants you to have the deluded thought that just because you're not as strong as you once were, just because you're not as committed as you once were, that you're still all right under the grace of God, I'm telling you, you're not all right. I'm telling you, under the authority of God's Word, faith without works is dead. Faith without the fruit of the Spirit. Faith without denying ungodliness. Faith without denying worldly lust is a dead faith. It's not a saving faith. Instead of making excuses, so many people need to repent and come back to their first love. Father, I just feel like praying. Lord, any person watching me tonight, listening, any person in this tabernacle, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, I pray that we would have a spirit of repentance. I pray that we would see your word as an everlasting covenant. Lord, that's only binding if we remain in the faith, if we place our faith in the Son of God on a daily basis. God, help us to understand that we are to take up our cross daily and follow you. I thank you for grace, Lord, that teaches me to deny ungodliness. Grace that pushes me to deny worldly lusts. Grace that helps me to live a holy, sanctified life. Looking for the appearing of Jesus Christ. Lord, rip us apart tonight. Rip us apart. And remove anything that, Lord, would hinder, oh, hallelujah, Lord, that would hinder our covenant, hinder our relationship, that would draw us away from you, Lord. Help us to discern what may look good, but yet it is very much evil in the plan of the adversary. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, I pray that you would stir up hearts to want to gather together again in the house of God. I'm asking you to convict and stir up hearts, to want to see produced in their lives the fruit of the Spirit, Lord. God, give us that desire. Give us this desire in the name of Christ. Go with me to John 15 in your Bible. And I want to read a few passages here. I just feel led to go here tonight. I believe it's very on topic with James. We're going to finish up James once we go back. But look with me at John chapter 15. I feel the presence of the Lord tonight, and I pray if you're watching live that you just have some sort of uh, glimpse of what it's like to be in the tabernacle to feel the presence of the Lord. Uh, John chapter 15 and verse number 1, Jesus said these words, I am, oh, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me, or every branch that puts faith in his finished work, that bears not fruit, what does he do? He takes away. Notice he says every branch in me. So there are people who are in Christ who are not bearing fruit. And if you're not bearing fruit in your life, if there's not the fruit of the Spirit, if there's not the gifts of the Spirit, if there's not good works flowing out of your life, Here's what's going to happen. He takes it away. 
And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it. So if you're someone who is living what you believe, and your faith has some action to it, and you're exhibiting your faith, and it's not just in word only, and you're consecrated, fully devoted to Jesus Christ, he's going to purge you, which means he's going to try you and test you. Why? So that you can produce more fruit. Oh, hallelujah. So that you can win more people to Jesus Christ. So that the anointing in your life and upon your life will be even stronger than it's ever been before. Great anointing comes with the price of great pressure, you see. He will press you just like that grape in the wine press is pressed to get the best wine. You're going to be pressed to produce the greatest anointing in your life. Come on, amen. The greatest presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. He will purge the one who bears fruit. And that it may bring forth more fruit. Verse 3 of John 15. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me. That's the key right there. Abide in Christ. It takes effort. Because your flesh is fighting against your spirit. And I'm telling you, if you allow the flesh to win very long, you're going to become one of these branches that does not bear any fruit. I've seen it so many times. I've seen it in so many ways. I've seen folks who were committed. They were on fire for the cause of Christ. They were consecrated to the kingdom of God. They were prepared in their soul and in their mind and in their heart to do the work of the kingdom. Only to see them walk away. Only to see them slowly drift away from what God had called them to do. What God had called them to be. And a lot of times we mistake tragedy and and, and, and difficulties in life, and we began to place those above the practicing the presence of God. Hear me tonight. I've seen it so much. Even sickness. I've seen people allow sickness in their life keep them from practicing the presence of God. I've seen people uh, go through times of trial on their job that would keep them from practicing the presence of God. And you began to place these things above the presence of God. And that's when you stop bearing fruit. <laughs> Here we go. Abide in me, he said. Verse 4. And I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide. You cannot bear the fruit of the Spirit without being full of the Holy Ghost. Anybody hearing what I'm saying? You cannot bear and you cannot produce love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness, goodness, and faith without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that takes a consecrated life. You, ladies and gentlemen, every day have to surrender and become a living sacrifice, you see. That's exhibiting your faith. You've got to pray when you don't feel like praying. You've got to cut off the TV and video games and the phone and whatever else is distracting you from the Holy Word of God. Come on, amen. And you must be, take time to be holy and read God's Word and pray and seek God's face. You have to tell yourself, you know what? I'm going to God's house no matter what. Come on, amen. You have to tell yourself, I'm going to be in the house of God. My family's going to be in the house of God. I'm telling you, when you take that attitude, when you take that approach, you're sanctifying yourself. And you become a vessel unto honor that the Lord can and will use. But he's looking for people who are willing to be used by his power, willing to be used by his glory. And I don't know about you, but I want to be used. Hallelujah. Glory. But it takes abiding in Christ. Verse 5, I am the vine. And you are the branches, and he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. In other words, tying this together with James, saving faith, genuine salvation, is going to produce the fruit of the Spirit 
and works that benefit the kingdom of God. God will be center and number one in your life. God will be the priority in your life. God's word will become a priority. Prayer, church gathering will become a priority. It won't be a problem. Come on, amen. amen. If you're abiding in Christ. And without me, he says, you can't do nothing. That's the truth. And if a man abide not in me, verse 6, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, not just eternal hell and punishment, but I'm talking about today in this world. When you allow yourself, when you allow your flesh to dictate your life, and the faith that you say you have is not producing any works or fruit, what's happening is you are slowly dying. One thing after the other begins to happen, doesn't it? You, you miss a couple of Sundays before you know it, you're not in church at all. Come on, amen. And it becomes easier and easier. I'm telling you to sit behind that screen right there and let that become your reality. And I'm telling you, you're slowly but surely dying. What do I need to do, pastor? You need to start abiding again. In the true vine, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you may bear the fruit of the Spirit. I don't want you to die. I don't want you to die spiritually. I don't want you to die physically. I don't want you to face an eternal fire. Verse 6. Cast forth, verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Now, I want everybody to circle and highlight this one word here in this passage. There's one word, and it's a contingent word. In verse 7, it's the first word. If. Everybody shout if. Yeah. It's contingent. If you do this, then this will be the result. If you abide in me. And my word abides in you. He said, ask what you will, and it shall be done. In other words, he's saying, if you're not abiding in the vine, don't expect to go to God in prayer and use it like a spare tire and expect God to intervene in your life because you are reaping what you've sown. But if, oh, hallelujah, but if you will come to God and open up your heart and rend your heart and not your clothes and repent and return to your first love, God, I believe with all my heart, will restore the years that the palmer worm and the canker worm and the locust has eaten. You believe that? Raise your hand and shout amen. Because he loves you tonight. He loves you tonight. And he wants you to come back to him. He wants you to start bearing fruit again. Verse 8, herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. That's what he The Lord desires not only that you bear the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit? Somebody tell me what the fruit of the Spirit is. Come on. Type it on the phone here. Let me hear it. Love. What's the next one? Joy. Peace. All right, now hold on. Who wants the love of God in your heart shed abroad? Well, that's a fruit of the Spirit. You can't love your enemy unless the Spirit of God is abiding in you. Come on, amen. amen. Joy? Who wants the joy of the Lord to be your strength? Well, that's the abiding of the Holy Spirit. Who wants the peace of God that passes all understanding? That's the fruit of the Spirit. What's the next one? Long. I like to say it like this. Long suffering. To suffer long. Come on, amen. Patience toward one another. Patience toward the Lord. Patience toward His Word. Patience toward the plan of God in your life. Gentleness, goodness, faith. Faith. To see Mount, you know, faith should be a progressive thing in your life. You know, Jesus talked about, and I don't want to preach 10 sermons here tonight. Jesus talked about, oh, you have little faith, no faith, much faith. Great faith, he used all those terms. And all that is is an escalation. It's, a, it's, it's your faith progressing throughout your life. 
and it should be. But faith does not progress unless you are abiding in Christ and he's purging you from time to time so that you can bear more fruit, which means you're going to go through a valley or two. You may go through a trial or tribulation in your life. And when you do, recognize that as the Lord purging you. Why? So you can bear more fruit. Come on, amen. amen. That's what he wants. He wants you to bear much fruit. Verse 9, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. How do you do that? By abiding in Christ. By allowing the Holy Spirit to have operation and free reign in your life. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. So notice verse 10. Notice how Jesus said, number one, there's the contingent word again. If you do what? Keep my commandments. You shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now, does, does this mean we'll be perfect? No, but you should be striving to be. Too many Christians use that as an excuse for their sin. They use it as an excuse for their laziness. They use it as an excuse to place things before God. Listen to me tonight. But he said, first, if you keep my commandments, then you abide in my love. That's evidence that you're abiding in the love of God. That's evidence that you're consecrated to Jesus Christ and that the Spirit of God is at operation in your life if you are keeping his commandments. Come on, amen. amen. And it won't be a problem. Verse 11, these things have I spoken unto, I'm just going to keep going, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. I want my joy full tonight. Amen. I'm full of joy, full of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. Think about that. Jesus is our friend tonight. We're heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Why? By the love of God. And God loves you so much that he sends the Holy Spirit to convict you of your sin. <laughs> convict you of your backsliding. And then you can repent and turn back to God. Oh, hallelujah. And when you do that, you can see the love of God abiding in your life. And you'll be able to love your neighbor. You'll be able to bless those who curse you. You'll be able to do that. All right, go back to James. I don't want to get too far in that. Somebody shout, I'm abiding tonight. Say it like this. I am, I am abiding, abiding in, Christ. in Christ. Hallelujah. James 2, let's finish up this chapter. Then we're going to pray. And look at verse... 18, we read that one. James says, I'll show you my faith by my works. In other words, true saving faith, a genuine salvation experience, will produce works unto righteousness and the fruit of the Spirit. And verse 19, thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. <laughs> Now notice the next stanza there. What does he say? The devils also believe and tremble. In other words, he is saying, you say you believe. Well, that's fine. But guess what? Devils believe and tremble and they know that he's the son of God and they would declare that Jesus is the son of God. But they're not saved and they're definitely not going to be spending eternity in heaven, in heavenly places. So what is he saying? It takes more than saying, I believe. There has to be a genuine regeneration. There has to be a genuine salvation experience. There has to be sanctification being produced in somebody's life, bearing the fruit of the Spirit. And once again, that fruit is the love of God, shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. Come on, amen. Amen. So the next time someone says to you, well, I believe, but they live like pure hell. They're half-heartedly consecrated, but they believe. And if that's you tonight, I want you to hear this preacher. You are not saved. You are not 
born again, and you will not see the kingdom of heaven. There must be some evidence. There must be some fruit unto righteousness. There must be works following a salvation experience. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 8 through 10, once again, For by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Yes, not of works, lest any man should boast. Yes, God grants you the faith to be saved, but you have to believe by making a decision. Come on, amen. You, your will, your free will plays a huge factor in your salvation experience and your walk with God after that. Come on, amen. And it's a daily walk. It's a daily experience with the Lord. But will thou know, O man, verse 20, that faith without works is dead? Once again, he raises the question. You say you believe, but there's no evidence in your life that you've been born again. <laughs> there's no evidence in your life that you're truly a Christian. You must repent so that there's some fruit and some evidence because once again, Jesus declared, Matthew 12, 33, a tree is known by the fruit that it bears. Verse 21, was not Abraham our father? He goes all the way back to Abram. Justified by works. Now he's not saying that Abraham was saved by his works. He was saying that the ju justification was evident by his works. In other words, he knew he was justified and he was righteous by his obedience. What did he do? Well, you know the story. When he offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar. Come on, amen. It's one thing to hear and read the Bible. People sit in this church every Sunday and Wednesday like tonight and you watch live on Facebook or YouTube or radio, podcast, wherever you are, and you hear the Word of God. But James goes on in his letter, and he will write, don't be a hearer only of the Word of God, but be a doer. Boy, James is so practical, isn't he? Oh, I love this book. Don't just hear what I'm telling you tonight. Digest it in your spirit. Father, Pray with me again, Lord, every person watching, every person listening. Lord, I pray that this word would be implanted into their heart tonight. Lord, I pray, God, that they would just not hear this word of righteousness, but that they would live this word by your help, Holy Spirit. May they consecrate their lives afresh. May they return to their first love and say, Lord, here I am. I belong to you tonight. Oh, Rabbi. Just raise your hands and begin to praise him wherever you are. Come on. Hallelujah. Lord, we honor you tonight in this tabernacle, wherever they may be watching. You get all the praise tonight. You are that vine, that true vine. We are the branches. We are abiding in you tonight by our choice, by our own free will. We are declaring we belong to God. Oh, hallelujah. And I bless you tonight, Heavenly Father. I bless you tonight, Heavenly Father. I bless you tonight. Hallelujah. Lord, let that word be planted in somebody's heart tonight. Abraham, in verse 21, he obeyed the word of God. And it was evident that he was justified by his obedience. Verse 22, seest thou how faith wrought with his works, a progressive faith. Once again, his faith was a, ref or his works rather, were a reflection of his faith. Come on, amen. What he was doing in obedience was reflecting the fact that he truly had faith in God. It goes far beyond a confession. So many people in churches are worried about how many people they can say, uh, declare Jesus Christ as Lord and sign a salvation card and you never see them again. 
Never hear from them again. I want to go back to the days of radical transformation. Come on, amen. I want to go back to the days where people are radically saved and delivered, and there's no doubt because of the fruit that's in their lives. That's what I want to see. How many want that in your own life? Hallelujah. And I say this is the most important chapter in the Scripture because you watching tonight, you have lost loved ones. You in this building tonight, you have lost loved ones. It could be a spouse, it could be a brother or sister, it could be a child, it could be a mother or father, it could be a friend, a co-worker, I don't know, but you have people in your circle that are lost. And we must understand that it goes beyond. And you witness to them or talk about Christ and they say, well, I was born again years ago and I, uh, I just kind of fell off. And fell. Folks, these people need to be saved. They need to be radically transformed by the power of God. Don't just go by them telling you they made a confession. Let's see some fruit and evidence that they've been transformed by the power of Almighty God. How many want to see that for your lost loved ones? Raise your hand way high. Father, I pray that conviction would come. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would convict every heart of every unbelieving family member. Every husband and wife, son or daughter, mother or father. I pray that you would convict them tonight. Lord, do it in their sleep. Give them a dream. Give them a vision. Lord, have them follow the ways of righteousness and not go to an eternal hell. But Lord, let them with their whole heart declare, I want Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, God, save them, I pray. Lord, save them, I pray. pray. Bring them to a saving knowledge of regeneration and justification. And let there be a radical conversion, a radical deliverance, a, a radical life change. And may they declare that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, but may there be fruit and works unto righteousness. You know, Look at me. The Lord, I believe this. I believe he will extend baby grace only so long. You know, people give their heart to Christ, and I've seen it, you've seen it. We've all seen this. And they do good for a little bit, then they get off track. Or maybe they're just half-heartedly serving God. They're more in love with the world than they are with God, more in love with career and more in love with the future and the, the prospects of the future and finding a husband or wife or, or, or something like that more than they are in love with God. And I've seen it so often. Seen it so often. The deception of just because a confession was made at one point or another. And I believe God will wink at things like that for a period. And you can sip on the milk for a little while, but there's going to come a point in your life, look, look at me, you're going to have to be completely, utterly sold out to Jesus Christ. There's going to come a point where baby grace will not be extended. And the grace of God's going to teach you to deny ungodliness. You're going to have to make the decision that God is more important than anything else in your life. Come on, amen. And you're going to belong to Christ 100% fully dedicated to Jesus. Who wants that for yourself tonight? Who wants that for your family? Raise your hand. Shout yes. Yes. Was faith made perfect, verse 22. In other words, Abraham's faith would grow by his obedience to take Isaac up to the mountain. And when he obeyed, God intervened. Did he not? Come on, amen. And there was a ram coming up the other side. And God says, I have provided myself a lamb. Notice the wording. I will provide myself as the lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. Verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God. 
How do we know that? By his obedience, by the fruit, by the evidence in his life, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Let me ask you something. Does your neighbor, people on your job, if you didn't tell them, would they know there was something different about you? Would they know that you were not part of this world, you don't partake in the language, you don't partake in the after-hour drinks, and you don't partake in the, the dinner that brings forth ungodliness in this world? Would they know that you were a Christian, that you belonged to God? Ask yourself that question. Because Abraham, was, there was evidence in his life that he believed God. And it was imputed to him for righteousness. Why? Because he had saving faith. That's what James is teaching us here tonight. Verse 24, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Now, uh, once again, he's not saying that it's faith plus works that equals salvation. He's saying that true saving faith will produce works and you will know without a doubt that someone is justified by the fruit and by the works that are in their lives. Amen. That's what he's saying there. Verse 25. Well, in other words, verse 24 could be read like this. Salvation goes far beyond just saying I'm saved or saying I believe because the devils believe. Did you hear what I said? James is telling us it goes far beyond just word knowledge and head knowledge of Jesus Christ. It is a heart condition and a heart transplant that takes place in one's life. And that's what I desire tonight. That's what I desire for this church. Verse 25, likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works. He's giving us examples. Remember Rahab when she hid the two spies and they came knocking on the door? in Jericho and said, are there two men in this house? And she says, absolutely not. Get up the road. Now think about that. She actually lied. Was that a sin? Boy, that's another sermon altogether right there. Come on, amen. <laughs> but it was her awareness and her action. That's the point of the story. That's the point of James. It was the actions of Rahab that proved that she was justified by faith, that she truly trusted in Jehovah God. It was the action, because faith is what? It's an action word, right? Faith is an action word. Verse 26, we'll close it out here. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Folks, the burden of my heart tonight is that every person watching and listening, every person in this room tonight, would be completely, totally, utterly sold out to Jesus Christ. James 2, once again, as I told you before, is in my opinion the most important chapter in the entirety of the New Testament because he teaches us that you just can't say that you belong to God. There must be a full commitment to Jesus Christ that can only come by your willful decision to say, I belong to Jesus. And then you will begin to mature and grow in grace, grow in Christ, grow in faith. And if you're not growing, you're dying. Let me say it again. If you're not growing, you're dying. And you're like that branch that's just withering away that will be cast into the fire. The fire of trial in this world and also the fire of an eternal hell. Listen to me tonight. Don't be deceived. Let me remind you of Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Jesus said these words, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But they which do the will of my Father which is in heaven. For many will come unto me in that day and say, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? 
In your name did we not cast out devils. In your name did we not perform many wonderful works. Yet I will say unto you, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye who work iniquity. Let me put it like this. You attended church when you could. You were committed to the ministry, committed to Christ when it was convenient and nothing else got in the way of it. Yeah, you paid your tithe, but begrudgingly. Never any fruit, never any gifts of the Spirit, never any works unto righteousness. And if it was, it was all self-centered. You're the person that he's going to say, I never knew you. Don't be that person. Be the person that's sold out and committed to Christ. Now, you know where you are with God tonight. You know when you're walking with him halfway. You know when you're following him afar off and you're really committed. And if you're not, you know that. You know if you could be in God's house tonight as opposed to watching online. You know that. And I'm telling you, he's looking for people who are sold out, who are committed to the Lord. Do you know in Africa, I talked to a brother a while back, pastor out there, at his church, that there are people who will walk over 10 miles to be in the house of God on a Sunday morning. They'll start in the middle of the night so that they could be in church. Walk! And he said that literally that they've seen tumors leap off of bodies and they've seen people rise up from being crippled. They've seen blinded eyes open. Why? Because they would rather have Jesus more than anything this world has to offer. Come on, amen. They don't have the luxuries that we have. Oh, no. But I'll tell you what they do have. They have an open line to heaven. They have a God who has looked down upon them and he smiled and he's winked and he's blessing them. I pray that would happen here. I pray that he shakes your life so much that it gets so discombobulated that you have to run to the house of God. That's what I pray tonight. That's what I pray. All so you can be truly born again by the power of Almighty God and see the fruit of righteousness. Pray with me, Father, tonight, corporately, including myself. Lord, I commit my life. I give you my life. Lord, take me tonight. You said if any man will follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Oh, hallelujah. And Lord, I pray tonight that many hearing this would make that commitment with me tonight, that they would take up a cross and that we would die together, that Lord Jesus, you may live, that Holy Spirit, you may have full reign in our body and in our life and live through us and perform your work in the earth and in the community and in our families that you've called us to do to fulfill the great commission. God, I ask you and I plead with you, I beg you, Holy Spirit, Lord, get us to the place to where all we want is our relationship with Jesus. Get us to the place where we're so uncomfortable with the world, with things we see on TV and things we hear on the radio and conversations that happen all around us. Give us get us to a place in sanctification and holiness that we can look at that and say, I don't want any part of it. But Lord, we want all that you have for us. Oh, hallelujah. For I would rather have you, Lord Jesus, than silver or gold. I would rather have you than riches untold. I would rather have Jesus more than anything. I would rather have Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, save our families. Save us, Lord Jesus. Lord, we repent tonight. We change our heart and our mind. May there be fruit. May there be evidence in our lives that we belong to you. May there be evidence in our lives that we do have the Holy Spirit. May there be fruit that we belong to God and that God belongs to us. Oh, hallelujah. 
Let there be fruit tonight. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus. It's the sweetest name I know. Just the same as his holy name. Hallelujah. Just raise your hands and begin to honor him in this place tonight. Lord, I ask you, I beg you, Lord Jesus. I beg you, Lord, to set ablaze and set afire the hearts of your people tonight. Lord, let there be a stream of your presence that flows through this church. Lord, let it be a stream of your presence that flows through this church. Pour out your spirit upon us, Lord, that we may see your glory and see your power evident at Willing Vessels Christian Center. Lord, I pray that revival would happen on Monday nights during prayer meeting. I pray that revival would happen here on Wednesday nights. And Lord, I pray that people would be saved in this house. That's what we pray. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Lord, we bless you tonight. Here's what I want to do before we close. If you're joining us, you can do it virtually, I guess. Uh, I want Trey come up here, grab one of these oils, these vial of oils right here. All right? And open that cap. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to anoint every pew in this building. All right? I want you to take it, take that cap off. And when you roll the top, oil comes out. You get it? So walk by these pews and swipe them. Yep, make sure oil gets on every pew. And I want you to believe with me tonight. Well, just do it on the side, like just swipe the side there. There you go. I'm going to save some of that. There we go. All right. I want you to agree with me that every person that sits in these pews would be so convicted to give their lives to Jesus Christ that, they, that they'll be sick to their stomach. And that they would have to run to this altar and say yes to Christ. Would you agree with me tonight that that would happen? Do you believe this kind of thing? Boy, I do. We used to do this when I was growing up. We would anoint the pews and just believe God to save them. Amen? And any person that's backslidden, when they sit in this pew, they'll be under conviction so much that they'll have to run to this altar and say yes to Christ. Just, yeah. Thank you. All right, put your hand on the pew in front of you, and you're in contact with the one you're sitting on. Stretch your hands toward the camera, or computer, whatever you're doing it, wherever you are. Lord, in the name of Christ, I pray right now, Lord, that every person who would sit in these pews when they come into this building, that they would be radically saved. Holy Spirit, I ask you to convict them. Oh, hallelujah. I ask you to convict them. Convict them, Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that they would be under such a heavy conviction that before the message is over, they've got to run to the altar to give their heart to you. And I'm asking you for it to be a radical transformation. Lord, I pray that word would get out that people that come to this church get saved, get delivered, get set free. And Lord, let that draw the masses of those who need to be born again. Let us bring in the harvest. Let us reap the harvest and let these pews, let this building, let this church be a harvest field that people who are backslidden would run to your presence, run to this altar and give their lives a living sacrifice. Oh, hallelujah. Holy Spirit, convict them of sin, of righteousness, convict them of judgment and convince them that Jesus, oh Lord Jesus, convict them that they need you more than they need anything else, even their daily bread. Oh, I feel your presence, Holy Spirit. 
Lord, convict those who sit in these pews. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm finished. And uh, if you're joining us live, thank you so much. I want to encourage you, unless you're confined to a hospital bed, be in God's house. Can't emphasize that enough. Be in God's house. We love you. Join me tomorrow night, 7 p.m., for a virtual prayer meeting. And then remember, next Monday, we're going to be here at 7 p.m. for prayer meeting. All right? Together. So you put it on your calendar next Monday at 7 to join me here. But tomorrow night, join me virtually. And we're going to be praying together. And then Sunday morning, no Sunday school, right? Silas, no Sunday school. No Sunday school until July, after July 4th. So we'll announce the date and all that. But no Sunday school. So tomorrow or Sunday morning, morning worship, 11 a.m. Be sure and join us. Bring somebody with you to God's house. And let's see somebody born again, transformed by God's power. Let the words of my mouth, meditations of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my 